Hello and welcome to Sustainable Kashi's free permaculture class. Uh, Sustainable Kashi is proud to host these classes to help us all connect with the, our ecosystems and each other using permaculture as our foundation. Uh, Sustainable Kashi is located in Sebastian, Florida. We have an 80 acre retreat center here on the naturally beautiful St. Sebastian River. Uh, we have nine different demonstration gardens so you can kind of get your hands in the soil and learn different ways and different styles of growing where we can show you different inputs and different yields using the different styles. So depending on how much you're willing to sweat helps you learn how many pounds of food you're gonna get out of the garden. We have an off-grid eco village here with regenerative systems that you can get your hands on to really learn how they work. Uh, we invite you all to come out for a visit once we reopen after this corona situation. Uh, and we'll, we look forward to opening up soon. So today's topic is finance. Uh, we're so grateful to have Laura O'Dane with us um, for a second time. And um, I wanted to start by asking everybody a question of how has the coronavirus affected you financially? Now I know the coronavirus has affected some of you. <laughs> uh, Christine. I've saved quite a bit of money. Oh, please e explain. Well, my husband loves to go out and eat, so I finally got my wish. <laughs> we don't go out and eat. We don't go out at all. So I save quite a bit of money there. Um, I love to cook from scratch, so I've been able to do that. Um, I just saved quite a bit of money. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I bet it's uh, helped your relationship with your husband a little bit, too, to spend some quality oh, time yeah. together. Absolutely. Excellent. And Amy says, uh, spending a lot more money on Amazon. Yes, I'm getting very familiar with those Amazon delivery packages myself. Um, it's tricky not being able to go to your local stores. That's, uh, we're very fortunate here to have a small community where we can still interact a little bit, but we're having, uh, having to do more shopping at Amazon ourselves. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Jeff says the unemployment money has been pretty close to my income. Oh, so, you, so the finances are staying pretty much the same. All right, way to go. Uh, anyone else have any stories of how their finances have changed or um, during, this, th during this time? Namaste, uh, it's Harry, it's yoga ma. Um, I'm a yoga teacher, so um, I, um, fortunately it hasn't, you know, changed my life super, super dramatically. Um, I've gone to doing a lot of the things that Christine has done because I enjoy those and now I have time because um, I have chosen not to go back to teaching at a gym because um, I just don't think that's the right way to um, conduct yoga right now. And um, another place that I taught actually closed, you know, the studio closed. And then I teach at Kashi as well, and we're not open. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, been a, a, a balance or a, you know, a juggle between being busy with work and now being busy with um, fun things and um, stuff like that. So it's Wonderful. been interesting. Um, Ganesh Daya loves to go out for breakfast, so we have definitely saved money there. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's wonderful practice on uh, cooking for myself. I've never cooked this much in my life, so I'm excited. I don't think any of us have, actually. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, sounds like we're all adapting quite nicely. Uh, I heard a really good saying that when you buy a drill, you're not buying a drill, you're really buying a hole in the wall. And I think that's one thing that we're all learning right now is that the, the drill is changing. We're not all able to do the same things we were able to do before. So we're all looking at different ways to get that hole in the wall. So it's really uh, wonderful to have these conversations to get us kind of thinking in that mindset. The first time I looked at economics through a permaculture lens was when I first read Sacred Ec uh, Economics uh, by Charles Eisenstein. And this book just kind of blew my mind wide open. I started looking at these relationships in economics and it really was exciting to me. Uh, I held a workshop on a trade basis. I didn't charge anything. I said, everybody's welcome to come, just pay what you can pay. And um, it really worked out great. People brought cuttings, people offered to pull weeds in the, in the garden in exchange for the class. 
And uh, I learned to change my definition of what a successful class looked like. It didn't equal this dollar amount that was, okay, this class was successful because it made $300. No, it was like this class impacted this many people and, and brought this much value to the community. So it really changed everything. And that's honestly why we're all here today and this free class, because I see the value of it. And maybe some of you are able to donate, maybe some of you aren't, and that's okay because we're all here growing. And as long as we're building into our community and giving our gifts back to our community, they're more than worth it. Uh, we had Laura, Laura on before and we had to abruptly end the class due to some uh, unfortunate hacking episode. Um, but we're very excited to have her back and it's, I'm very excited to reintroduce Laura to share with us a financial world of permaculture. Laura, thank you for being here. Sure, I'm delighted to be back. Could I ask people, everyone on the call, to type into the chat whether or not you participated that first time around with me last month, just so I know how much to repeat from my first presentation, or if I should um, go further into, move through it quickly and get us into conversation. So, it looks like some of you didn't, but many of you were there. Well, the, I, as I understand, actually, I think I've seen it, that first presentation was video recorded it, and is up on Sustainable Kashi's um, YouTube channel. If so, okay. So I probably will go through at a slightly quicker pace um, using the sli same slideshow, because I'd really like us to get to the conversation part of it. Um, so let me go ahead and get into screen share. Okay, so we're all here because we have some understanding of the word permaculture. So I won't go into a deep explanation of permaculture, but I do want to talk about this financial component and this broader view of permaculture because so many people come to permaculture from growing food and working in the landscape. But the permaculture flower actually has seven petals and one of them is the finance and economics petal. So all of the principles that we apply in, in the landscape, we can um, use those to guide us in our relationship with um, money, the economy and finance. And so these slides are just to show this um, relationship already there outlined or this framework already outlined in a lot of permaculture materials around connecting permaculture and, and, and finance. And I always like to point out that it, in permaculture, in the landscapes, our presumption is abundance with the food forest. That's what we're always working towards. We know that's possible. I think it gets lost when we think about permaculture and money, that um, especially for those of us that are sustainably minded, we have a negative impression about it. And we just, I think we go into scarcity mindset and lack a lot quicker around money than we do around um, the, you know, what we can produce in our landscapes. So I always like to point out that as well, that. Bill Mollison, one of the co-originators of permaculture, said in, at a permaculture design training he was giving in 1983, he charged us to be the bankers to start learning about money and handling it. Because if we handle it, we can direct it to things that are regenerative and help steer it away from extractive and um, depleting practices. So this is just to encourage us to really recognize, I always consider my dollar, every dollar I spend is a very powerful vote. And I'm not convinced that it's not more powerful than my political vote when I go to the ballot box. And so it's how we spend, it's how we earn our money, it's how we invest our money, how we manage our money. It's all making a statement or how we don't do any of that. So again, in permaculture, there has been a history of these financial permaculture discussions. There was a financial permaculture institute that um, was initiated, I think, around 2010, maybe a little before or after, 
the it's now defunct, but the website lives on. And these are some of the um, the concepts that the team that came together around that permaculture, permaculture Institute put in place to help us understand and guide us when we talk about financial permaculture. So again, I'm not going to go deep into that. It's like a, it's still on the website. I did go into it a little more in the first presentation I made. So you could always watch that on the Kashi website or the Kashi YouTube station. So one of the fundamental concepts in financial permaculture is this idea of the eight forms of capital. And this is not an idea that's original to permaculture. It's just something that um, two people, Gregory Land Landua and Ethan Rowland, compiled um, in, from a permaculture perspective. And this really guided the thinking around the Perm Financial Permaculture Institute. And well, this thinking that the Institute did was much more at the macro level, creating economic systems. I also think that these eight forms of capital or these multiple or additional forms of capital are extremely valuable to us at the personal level. I really, I'm not an economist, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm, you know, that's not my, my educational background, but I do, I have done out of necessity because I did have a four, I do have a 401k from an employer. I did some research into what I can be doing with my money that's more regenerative. And I really think that these eight forms of capital are a great tool for us as we pursue regenerative personal finance, in addition to regenerative practices at the more macro or broader level. And so beauty of these forms of capital when we look at them is that if we recognize that financial capital that's the one we all work with the most. That's the one we as a society have agreed upon as a means of exchange. But the only reason we want that final financial capital is because it's the access point to all the other forms of capital. It's these other forms of capital. Those are the things we want. And so if we can find ways to access these forms of capital for less money or no money at all, we can reduce our need to go out and take on a job that maybe we don't really enjoy or doesn't fulfill us. We can reduce our stress level around meeting our needs and feeling abundant. And so I, I don't say this to encourage us to view all of these other things as transactional items, but it's more of a safety net approach. You know, this, it's where the security comes in. The financial security we want is just so we can feel secure in these other forms of capital. So if we can think about other ways to access these forms of capital, we can increase our, the secure, our secure sense of security and agency in our lives. All right, so Financial capital, again, this one that we've all agreed is the means of exchange. Of all of those other forms of capital we just looked at, financial capital is probably the least resilient. It's, um, it's the most volatile and the most fragile. So again, the, we can increase our own resilience and our own security by really focusing more directly on these other forms of capital. And, okay. So this idea of optimizing for multi-capital abundance, this is something that I took um, straight from Ethan Rowland. This is the subtitle of one of his books, The Regenerative Enterprise. And it's just underscoring what I've been saying before. I, I think the richer we can become in these other forms of capital, the more secure the more let me back up if we talk about financial capital we talk about creating a diverse portfolio of wealth that's even within pursuing that type of wealth there's this talk of diversity you want to have a variety of investments you don't want to be invested in only one thing because if something happens to that one thing all of your wealth disappears 
It's the same for these multiple forms of capital. Now, I'm not suggesting we all need to have super high levels of all of them, but we can think more about increasing our abundance in you know, a certain few of them specifically to raise them up. But we can also look to our neighborhood and our community and our friends and family and think about where are they rich in forms of capital? Because for you, that's kind of an extension. You know, that's capital that you have access to. So if you have family or friends um, that are um, strong in some of these forms of capital, you may not need to emphasize them as much. And I'm not trying to stress everyone out and get everyone thinking, oh my gosh, I need to be rich in all these forms of capital. Um, but we could be strategic about it. And so I really think that, you know, this picture on the left um, represents experiential capital. So I didn't run through the definitions of all those forms of capital this time. Again, that's in the other video, but it's, I, you could see that there was intellectual capital and experiential capital. And I think as permaculturalists, we pretty strongly gravitate to this experiential capital. It's one thing to sit and read your permaculture textbook or a gardening book, but it's a completely different thing to get out in the garden and actually experience it. And gardening is basically experimentation, <laughs> especially here in a climate like Florida. So, you know, you, it's one thing to read about fixing a car, which is flexing your intellectual capital, but actually fixing a car or fixing a bike, that's the experiential capital. And I think with what's happening in the world today, experiential capital can't be overemphasized. And I think it's a form of capital that can pretty easily be converted, if necessary, into financial capital by performing a service for someone or in exchange for another form of capital or just for bartering or to help out a friend when someone's in need. The, um, the middle picture, this is um, something that I, it's a meat grinder set for a KitchenAid meat grinder that I rescued from a thrift store dumpster. You know, someone at the thrift store didn't recognize the value of it. It wasn't going to do well on the shelf of their little thrift store. They have limited space. And at the bottom down here, I have written, try thinking about tangible assets and stores of value. So this was something that I sold on eBay for 60 some dollars, making myself $40 out of something I rescued from the trash because someone didn't recognize the value of it. So I think educating ourselves about what are high quality brands, what things hold their value, what things could we purchase, you know, if we're getting concerned about our financial capital being in the bank, um, what are some things we could purchase that, are, that would hold their value and that could be a store of value should we need it? Now, I'm not, again, I'm not a financial expert. I'm not predicting a collapse. But if we're diversifying and optimizing for multi-capital abundance, that's, that's just a thought. And again, these higher quality goods can be more easily converted for cash or barter if we need to. And then the, the mango capital, the avocado abundance, I think most of us are here in Florida. We are so fortunate. Um, there's so much food that grows around us throughout the year. And we live, we happen to live in a place with a good number of elderly people or people who just have fruit trees um, or food producing plants in their yards that don't have any interest or don't maintain them. And so much of it is just falling and going to waste. Now we can be going around and helping them and clean it up and add it to our compost piles or, you know, have it for ourselves and to eat, share it with our friends, barter it. I've taken some of the excess produce to uh, a produce store here and bartered it for eggs and other things that I don't need. I have a friend here who's started foraging food and is starting a, a business around these foraged fruits. You know, he's going to be selling them. So there, I think if we open our eyes to so much of the wealth that surrounds us already that we get stuck in um, this rat race, this current economic paradigm where we feel like, and we, in some cases we do, 
you know, we, we, we're focused on meeting those, getting money, meeting our daily needs, paying the rent, getting food on the table. But when we find ourselves with enough time, if we can, to step back and really look around, there's so much wealth, even just in our landscape that we're overlooking. You know, I, I think I shared the example last time, or maybe it's further down here, that um, I needed a shower curtain rod and it's not a huge expense, but I really just, I don't like to purchase things new, one for the financial impact, but also just for the resources used in making it, if it has to be shipped, it has to be disposed of later. What is the end life of that product gonna be? If our thrift stores are throwing things out, and I've had this affirmed several times, I, I do not want to give people the impression they shouldn't donate to thrift stores. I don't know what the answer is, but just know we Americans have so much stuff, it's going out the back door. <laughs> but um, so, but some, and some of it's still perfectly good like this. It can be tapped and turned into financial capital or social capital or some other form of capital. But just, you know, looking at, so when I needed the shower curtain, I ended up finally opening my eyes to the slender bamboo in my yard for the shower curtain rod and made it out of that. You know, we have local herbalists here who have given, who are talking about how two of the primary herbs to treat, um, or not treat, that's, I think a technically a word the FDA won't allow me to use, but certainly it can support us if we do contract coronavirus, our Spanish needle and seda. You know, they're right there in our yards. Most people are applying Roundup and, and to these, and they're things that can help us if you provide support. So I just think if we can slow down or even just once in a while, just challenge yourself to go out in your yard or in your neighborhood and look at things and think about, oh, what might I be able to do with that that I'm not doing? I think there's more wealth around us than we um, slow down to realize. Okay, so these are just the permaculture, 12 permaculture principles. Again, um, most of you are familiar with them. And they, like I said, they can all be applied to um, financial matters as well. And so in the next slides, I'm just applying a few of them to personal finance. So if we look at apply self-regulation and accept feedback, that's, you know, we can think about that as the get out of debt. Um, I think we, to the extent that we talk about finance in permaculture, or per, um, I think we do hear people talking about the importance of avoiding debt and having that sense of agency. I think it's super, super important. It's not, this isn't an attempt to make anyone feel badly who is in debt. We have a system right now that pretty easily guides many of us into debt, but just know that there are resources out there to help you get out of debt. And that once you get out of debt, there's a lot of strength, security, and just agency from being in that position. Okay, so after we get ourselves out of debt, we want to obtain a yield. Okay, so we want to be holding on to earning money and holding on to it. So sometimes we start earning, you know, we get out of debt, but if we don't step, curb our spending, or if we inflate our spending, now that we're out of debt, we'll lose our yield. And so we wanna spend less than we earn. And those are some good resources I've shared here to um, help us think about spending less than we earn. I can't recommend Your Money or Your Life highly enough. That book is fantastic. Okay, so earn more. That's the other thing we can do to obtain a yield. If, you know, if we have time and space beyond what we're already doing potentially in our nine to five job. And I always like to encourage people to think about regenerative right livelihoods. Are there ways that are regenerative that they could, that you could pursue to earn your, your livelihood? And so the top two are um, resources that focus specifically on regenerative livelihoods. One is a free course from Gaia University that's the top left. The other one is this Find Your Eco Niche pre-course that Heather Jo Flores puts on. 
you can find those online. The bottom two are more mainstream resources, but we can also use the, the principles. We can look at the principles of mainstream personal finance and use those to our advantage as well. We don't have to take everything from that system, but we can, just like we use Facebook and Zoom and some of the things that aren't necessarily ideal, we can still learn from them. And I really like that Side Hustle School podcast just to get ideas of like, oh, wow, people are making money from that. I would have never thought of it. Okay. And so again, going back to what I was talking about, this would spend less there's my shower, bamboo shower curtain rod. I just think the more we have our skills, the more we can reduce our footprint, we'll save money by doing that. I love Jenny Nazak's book, Deep Green. Jenny is our treasured resource here in Florida. She's over in Daytona Beach. And she has a website that has all kinds of great resources for living a low carbon footprint life. That top right picture, sadly enough, is a, a an Aldi dumpster here in my area on the Sunday before Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, full of food. So I get most of my food from grocery store dumpsters. I probably don't even spend $50 a month on groceries. If that, that's just to buy my olive oil and you know salt things that I don't find in the dumpster as often. And I eat very, very well. I dumpster dive at a local health food store as well. There's just, there's, there's no such thing as waste. There are just misdirected resources. And so if we can take the time to look for those misdirected resources and work with them, again, it's a way to spend less and keep more money for ourselves if we need to, or have more money to divert to regenerative practices. So observe and interact. If, um, if you're earning money and having a hard time keeping track of where it's going, you know, and obtaining that yield, you can start thinking about tra tracking your spending, maybe get a budget for a month or so, just even for a month to get an idea of where your money is going can be helpful and eye-opening. So the catch and store energy. So once we're, we're earning some money, we're out of debt, we're obtaining that yield, we're, you know, we're not overspending that yield, then we can start looking at how to build up the savings and do it in um, regenerative ways. So these are some resources. The Resilient Investor book, that's a great book. It's actually the only investing book I know of that mentions the word permaculture. It's written by two men who, I, who have PDCs, and I believe at least one of them is a permaculture instructor. They run natural um, investments and uh, a wonderful investment advisory firm. So there are resources out there that we can use to help us be regenerative and building up our, oh, and then this whole concept of FU money. You know, once you have some of that money saved up, you're not beholden to a job or maybe a person that doesn't resonate with you. You have that financial agency to walk away and not be living, or even just not be living in fear of losing your job. So it's, it's a place of strength. And then um, these are just some examples. Once you do have some money saved up, if you want to be doing regenerative things with it, there are more and more um, ways to direct our money in ways that align with what we think about as financial permaculture. And so these are some, just some of them, slow money, there are slow money chapters in different parts of the country. We don't have one here in Florida yet that I know of, um, but there are other options. The Put Your Money Where Your Life Is is a brand new book about investing locally through self-directed IRAs. So we think of 401ks, most people don't even know that self-directed IRAs exist. And that's what I've done is I've transferred all of my money, well, most of it, out of my 403b into a self-directed IRA. And a self-directed IRA allows you to invest in everything except collectibles like race cars and art and life insurance and S stock. So it opens you up to a whole new way of investing. I've invested, I've bought an ownership share of a permaculture farm here in Florida. I've invested in that Kachua Impact Fund, which has a social justice component, a sustainability component. You know, again, there's the natural investments team. I have posted on my blog about some of the things I've found to invest in. I, I just wrote a social justice investing 
post and compiled a whole bunch of things we can be doing. We can be banking with the Native American bank. You know, these, these communities that um, suffer, find, struggle financially, they, they are burdened by lack of access to capital. And we can help them just by opening up a bank account with their credit union or a minority owned bank or this um, Native American bank. So we don't even, if we can't afford to donate or give our money away or invest, we can even just by opening a bank account in the right place, be giving them more capital to use, to direct to home, um, to mortgages and small businesses that struggle, especially for people of color. We know the what racial wealth gap, gap statistics. So, um, so that's the end of the presentation. I would love to have um, conversation now, reactions to the presentation, thoughts, and then I have some questions if we want guided questions, and maybe Terry does as well, but let me back out of screen share. But if people have questions or want to take the discussion in a certain direction, please feel free. The easiest way to uh, field the questions would be to type your questions into the comment section and we'll be able to read them uh, that way. Um, so I have a question and you had addressed um, living your passion in with making money and have um, I've noticed that in saving pools, this is like uh, saving uh, bank accounts within communities, the uh, recidivism, the um, default rate is extremely low because it's your community members. It's, uh, it's so people, it's less than 1% of people that just don't pay it compared to a relatively high default rate in the commercial banking industry because it's faceless and it's, it, it's easy. Um, have you seen a lot of examples of that in uh, private economies or um, in people making money within the community? You know, most of what I've heard around that example has actually been in um, overseas, you know, I think where people live closer together in smaller communities and it's, it's a more natural thing. I mean, I, I, slow money is a version of that to some extent. It's, it's not exactly what you're talking about where it's kind of just more informal among a group of close or neighbors or, or friends or just community. But I think slow money is the, the larger version of that lending to businesses. I think what you're talking about could be more, you know, lending to a friend who wants to get out of credit card debt or, you know, just a, a more informal need than I have a business plan and here fund my business. So I have, like I said, most of what I've heard about that has been, you know, in, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa or just places where there's a different sense of community. I think they can work. I've heard conversations about them. I think that's what Corrine Brennan is trying to work towards with some mutual aid stimulus check funding for people that um, you know don't need all of their stimulus check money. It, but it's I've been working on it from a larger picture here in my community in St. Pete trying to get a local lending club going or an invest local investing club, which is a heavier lift because there are financial structures that need to be in, in place. But I think what you're talking about is a simplistic model. And I wish I had, I wish I knew of more models like that, because I would like to see that. And I, I think that that book that I was talking about, Michael Schumann's, the, um, I can't remember, the invest, you know, or where you live. I think that's going to be a good um, model to help people with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Kashi Frank. Um, I love the idea of banking with minority banks. How do you find them? Okay, so if you'd like, if you want to, so my blog is Rich and Resilient Living, and I have a, pot, a blog post on there. It's still on the front page. It was like three or four posts ago called Impact Banking, and I have lots of good resources in that one and in my social justice post, they are definitely out there. And ever since, you know, what's happened, you know, with raising our consciousness around racial justice recently, there's lots of conversation about it and just more um, 
it's easier to find the information. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll actually post that in our Facebook community as well so everybody can get a chance to read it. Uh, we have a question from Christine Kane. Uh, she has an EE savings bond, which is matured. Is 2020 a good year for me to cash it in? I suspect that tax laws will significantly change in the future. Any ideas? Again, I am not a financial advisor. <laughs> so I, I honestly don't, I don't know how to advise you. And since even if I had a glimmer of a thought, I think I would be stepping into some unsafe territory answering that question. I'm really sorry, but um, I, I don't know how to advise you on that. Amy, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on stocks. I was starting to look into it recently for, uh, I guess, like the second time, and it's just, it feels so funky. So what are your thoughts on it? So for me personally, I still have some money in socially responsible stocks, but even that, so let me step back. Stocks, all those companies, their decisions, if they are issuing stock, are shareholder driven. They have to benefit the shareholder with every decision they make. Now, more and more companies are pursuing socially responsible missions or you know, trying to meet these ESG, environmental, social, and governance um, indicators. But I, I think at that large scale and just being driven by answering to the shareholder who is solely focused on profit usually, that it's, it's really challenging. Now, especially if you want to try and do it the easy way by investing in some kind of index or mutual fund where you're buying a pool of stocks, so you, you're getting the whole package. You're stuck with everything. You're, you're basically supporting everything that's in that fund. If you want to step back and um, do some direct, you know, individual stock picking, I think there's some potential in that. You know, I, I have a note to myself to think about buying waste management stock at some point, because I think with all that's going to be necessary for recycling and handling all this waste, there may be some potential for that. Um, you know, stocks of companies that have, that are B corporations, if they are going the stock options, so B corporations are businesses that have committed to the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit, you know, looking at shareholders beyond their traditional shareholders. So if they're issuing stock, um, yes, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel badly for investing in stocks. Those are just my thoughts. If it's shareholder driven, without that certified B Corp type perspective, then by its very nature, it's, that's not gonna be its um, decision-making lens. But I do think that there are some, it's just that the more individual stock picking and direct picking is a better option. Thank you, thank you. I'd love to hear from people how aligned you feel your money is with your permaculture values. And um, I guess that you could just answer that question. And if it's not as aligned as you'd like, what are your struggles? Where are your pain points in aligning it with your values, your money with your values? Well, I can answer that one personally. I feel there's <clears throat> a big disconnection with environmental destruction with profit. And I don't feel that industry or consumerism is really possible without a price tag of some kind of environmental destruction. And um, I would personally like to get closer to that relationship of producing for myself. So I'm not part of that destruction. Mm -hmm. um, at least I know I could do it personally in a more respectful way. Um, so I try and more and more every day, but I definitely don't, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still getting some Amazon and delivery packages to my front door, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes, certainly. I, I could, that, just that statement I can see is very infused with Charles Eisenstein. That way of thinking is, is very much 
from his writings as well. And I don't disagree with it. I think ultimately maybe that is the ultimate destination. And then what we're talking about are just kind of gradations or steps along the way that get us the less bad, you know, to, towards that more, you know, from less bad towards the, the ultimate regenerative um, scenario. We have Grace said uh, she started a caregivers co-op. She needs more business skills learning how to do this. Okay. And so Grace, I would, I wonder there, you know, so many communities, again, looking at these untapped resources here in St. Pete, we have a wonderful city and chamber funded entity called the, the Greenhouse which is a collaboration between the city and the chamber and they offer such a wide array of free classes and free consulting and so i don't know where you live i don't know if you've looked around in your community um, or even just asking friends that run businesses to to talk to you but i think we can tap some networks and resources that are out there that we just don't traditionally think about or know that are there. Beautiful. I really want to thank you for your time in this, uh, this wonderful collection of knowledge. Um, is there a way to get in touch with you personally, uh, be uh, uh, your blog or your website? Yes. So on my website, there is a contact tab and you can email me through that contact tab on richandresilientliving.com. Wonderful, wonderful. And we're going, uh, Laura has wonderfully donated a consultation for uh, the winner of this week's uh, prize. And by uh, being <clears throat> to enter that, simply answer what your biggest takeaway from today's class was in our Facebook community class, in which Amy will wonderfully uh, enter into the chat section right now. Please join us there to continue this conversation. Um, and we'd I also want to thank Amy for all the hard work she's doing in producing and keeping all of us on this call so fantastically. Um, we also, if you enjoy these calls or get anything out of them, feel free to donate to us. We have a donate button over there that helps pay for the Zoom line and keep us running. Um, uh, this, all this video will be edited and uploaded onto our YouTube channel so you can access it free there uh, at your convenience. Uh, make sure you join us for next week's call, which is going to be Greg Noonan talking about designing residential abundance. So for those that are living in the city, that's going to be a fantastic uh, class to join in. So personally, I've always been afraid of money, um, and I really want to change that. This time of isolation has really helped me ask uh, what I want and what I'm willing to let go of. And I feel it's time to change the way we think about making money, uh, decide whether we want to serve it or we want to serve our communities. This time is right to connect our economy to our passions. The time is right to take the greed out and put the love in. So together we can build these interconnected communities together that profit. So thank you for joining us on this important topic and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks, thank you everybody. very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Laura. That was incredible. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>